What's going on you guys? This is Brandon from Investment Hockey Advising here and today we'll be talking about the main differences between NCAA D1 and NCAA D3 hockey. And as always, just before we dive into the video here, just a reminder to smash that like button, hit that subscribe button, hit that notification bell, and share the video if you like the content. Quick note on sharing, not only do you help us as a channel if you share the video, but you also help other you know players and families out there that could really use this information. So if you like the video, if you can share on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, whatever platform you're on, we would greatly, greatly appreciate that. Also, if you wanna reach out to us at any time, feel free to drop a comment down below in the comments section, or you can even email us at info at ahadvising.com and we'll reply to you as soon as we can. And last quick thing, like all our videos, there's gonna be timestamps throughout the video. So if you wanna to get to any specific topic that you wanna see, feel free to click on that or you can just watch the entire video. It's up to you. All right, so enough about that stuff. Let's dive right into it here. So the reason why we're making this video here is a lot of players and parents, you know, a lot of them say, hey, I want to go play NCAA hockey. And it kind of just stops there. The conversation ends there. They don't really stop to consider all the different implications, what it means to play NCAA D1 hockey. How much does it cost? What's the experience like? And ver versus NCAA D3, you know, what's that experience like? How much does that cost? You know, what are the difference between both? So in this video, we kind of want to shed light on that and really highlight the, the key differences. And so the four main components here that we want to look first, the caliber, you know, how strong the level of play is, what's the difference between the two of them, then the overall experience, right? How, what's it like to go to an NCAA D1 program versus an NCAA D3 program? Afterwards, we're going to look at the recruitment process, you know, what leagues coaches look at, you know, how exactly they go about their whole recruitment process, NCAA D1 versus D3. And then finally, probably the topic that a lot of parents are going to be interested in, we're going to look at the cost, you know, how much does it cost to play NCAA D1, you know, full scholarships, maybe stuff like that. And then, you know, NCAA D3, how much does it cost to go there? Is it realistic for me financially to go to an NCAA D3 program? So we're going to cover all that and more. Uh, in the video here moving forward. I want to make a quick note though that we're generally speaking about NCAA D1 versus NCAA D3. It greatly, greatly varies by program. Everything, all the factors we mentioned, it varies so much from program to program. So you really have to do your research, talk to experts about the different programs when you get to the nitty gritty of things. But on a general level, you know, we're going to highlight all the stuff here. Also, last quick note too, as we've touched on before in our previous video, NCAA versus Major Junior. If you've played any sort of major junior hockey, you're probably ineligible. There are exceptions to the rule, and we cover that in depth in our video, but chances are if you've played major junior, if you play for multiple years, let's say, you can't go NCAA, so this video is probably not, not the right video for you to watch. But you know, if you haven't played major junior, you're all set, and we're gonna dive into the video here. All right, so let's dive right into our first point here, which is the caliber or the level of play. Short answer here, NCAA D1 is stronger than NCAA D3. I mean, it kind of makes sense, right? That's why they're kind of classing and ranking that way, D1 versus D3. Quick note, there are a few NCAA D2 programs, but they all play against NCAA D3 programs. And to be honest, uh, the like the elite NCAA D3 programs are stronger than the NCAA D2 programs. But that's just a side note. Anyway, so the caliber, yes, generally NCAA D1 is stronger. I would say though, one quick caveat to this is that the really elite NCAA D3 programs could compete, I would say, against the, maybe the top five or the top 10 would probably compete if not beat the lower end NCAA D1 programs. And that just goes to show that there is some overlap, but generally speaking, like let's say the top NCAA D1 teams, let's say North Dakota, Boston College, Boston University, all those schools, you know, on any given night would probably beat even the elite NCAA D3 programs. You know, it's just, you can't, it's like comparing apples to oranges at that point, you know? So NCAA D1 generally is stronger than NCAA D3. Now, how do we compare that caliber to, let's say, you know, youth sports programs in Canada or major junior programs in Canada? I would say that on a general level, and again, this is general, it depends from program to program, but NCAA D1, I would say, is a slight tier over than U Sports altogether. You know, and then NCAA D3 would fall, you know, maybe a tier or two under U Sports, but again, very general. But I would say, yes, NCAA D1 is probably the highest. When you compare it to Major Junior, it's kind of hard because there is a big age difference here. Most NCAA D1 players fall between the lines of, you know, 19 to 20 to 24 to 25 years old. So, and then most major junior players, you know, range from 16 all the way to 20 years old or so. So it's, it's hard to compare. I would say they're both 
quite equal. They're different. I would say just because of the age, NCAA D1 might have an edge, but again, it's it's hard to, to compare this. But altogether, NCAA D1 is great hockey. It's very, very strong, and there's a lot of players that go on and play the NHL one day. And NCAA D3 is also quite strong, but if guys who move on from NCAA D3, you know, they're they're generally more geared towards minor pro hockey if they keep playing afterwards. So altogether, that's what it's looking like for Caliber. All right, so let's move on to our second point here, which is the overall experience. So we're gonna start with NCAA D1. Typically, the campus is mid to, to big. So I would say, you know, some campuses are just as big as 40,000 students, you know, so it's it gets really big sometimes. Um, whereas NCAA D3, you know, is, is typically very small, you know, maybe like some are as small as, you know, 1,500 or 2,000 students, and it can kind of go up to, to mid-level to maybe 10,000 students or so, but typically it's smaller at the NCAA D3 level. When you look in terms of facilities, typically NCAA D1 is top-notch, you know, and NCAA D3, it, it kind of varies, but most NCAA D1 programs have really nice rinks on campus, and yeah, the facilities are awesome, you know, the equipment's completely provided for. Now, at the NCAA D3 level, some schools, again, it, it can be like insane when you, when you look at the facilities like Oswego State, for example, the locker room's amazing, the rink's amazing, the equipment's completely provided for you. Like you, you get royal class treatment as you would at, in a top NCAA D1 program. But, you know, overall NCAA D1 does have an edge on this, I would say. But then again, yeah, it varies from program to program. Like some, for example, Oswego has a much better facility than, you know, some lower end NCAA D1 program. So it definitely greatly varies. Now, in terms of schedule and overall busyness, I would say, you know, NCAA D1 is usually you know, much busier. I would say there's a there's about a 40 game schedule that teams play and you're practicing, you know, having workouts and team meetings almost every day. It's really, really intensive. And the season's also much longer, like hence the 40 games, but usually the season starts a little bit earlier and ends a little bit later at the NCAA D1 level versus NCAA D3, you know, the season is shorter and you play about 25 games. So you're a little less busy and the season is shorter. But that being said, you still have a decent, you know, amount of stuff to do you usually practice almost every day you work out you know a, a lot of the times uh, several times throughout the week uh, you have a lot of team meetings you know so you're definitely busy at the NCAA D3 level but a little less compared to NCAA D1 so overall that's kind of the differences in overall experience that you would see between the two levels all right so moving on to our third point here which is the recruitment style so I would say let's start with NCAA D1 Pretty much for them, they try and find the best players they possibly can, especially the elite programs. You know, obviously it varies from program to program depending on how elite they are on the whole spectrum of schools. But I would say like the elite ones, they try and, and find the top players and try and get them before they actually go and play major junior hockey before they become ineligible. You know, those programs really get guys like, you know, Jack Eichel, Jonathan Taves, all those guys to try and you know, go to their program and then go play pro afterwards, you know. But then maybe the lower end programs, they still try and find, you know, solid players, you know, really, really good hockey players, but that are maybe a little bit, you know, under the radar a little bit, a bit more low key, but that are really, really great hockey players as well. So overall, NCAA D1 programs try and recruit, you know, the best players they possibly can at, from a very young age, usually. Now, some programs, not always at a young age, you know, some are a little bit older, but most of them start the recruiting process around 15 or 16 years old. Like they really start early and they make their commitments early for future classes. So that's something to consider. Now for NCAA D3, on the other hand, um, their recruiting is definitely a little bit later. They definitely start looking at guys, you know, I'd say earliest 18 years old, but even then that's pushing it. Most of their commitments, which are verbal commitments, they're usually around 19 or even 20 years old in the last year. I got my commitment two months before uh, the, the academic year started when I was 20. So, you know, it, it can really, really be last minute. Typically not that last minute, but it can definitely be last minute like that. And NCAA D3 programs, they try and go for good hockey players, but obviously they can't go for the absolute elite because, you know, the, they're gonna go NCAA D1 or Major Junior. They try and go for the, you know, the good hockey players that are kind of in between, you know, the guys that play, you know, maybe, aren't maybe the stars of a good league, but that play in a good league on a, on a pretty good team that advances players and, and that, that do well, you know? So for example, maybe they look at a guy that's a, you know, a third liner, 
and the CCHL has played on his team for two years or something like that. That's just an example, but those are the kind of players that they look at. But again, it varies uh, by the program, you know, by the tier of the program on the spectrum. So that's, that's basically the difference between the recruitment process. Now, if you want to know exactly which leagues uh, to go to that'll maximize your chances, of playing you know at the highest level of college hockey then definitely check out our rankings video that we made about a month ago uh, it's I think it's been our most popular video so far and it's definitely a great video to kind of give you an idea which leagues you should try and target to when you play when you're looking to go play uh, junior hockey so definitely take a look at that if you have a sec all right so let's get into our fourth and final point here which is cost right what's the difference between NCAA D1 and NCAA D3 financially well the single the biggest difference here is that NCAA D1 programs can offer athletic scholarships while NCAA D3 programs cannot. So that is the single biggest difference. So how do these athletic scholarships work? Well, coaches at almost every NCAA D1 program, there are exceptions and we'll get into those, but most of them coaches have 18 full scholarships that they can offer, full athletic scholarships. And what they do is they typically divide them you know, usually they have about a roster of 25 to 26 hockey players that they want to fill for a given year. And typically when they look at recruits, they divide that scholarship money out. So let's say th they try and divide it strategically too. So let's say, you know, their top six forwards and their top four D, they're going to give them, you know, full ride scholarships or, or maybe less than that, but they're going to give them almost full ride or full ride scholarships when it comes to the athletic part. And then let's say, you know, maybe third liners or the third pair of D, those guys, you know, maybe get half scholarships and then the guys lower in the roster get less and less. And, and maybe, you know, there's a couple walk-ons on the team too that get no athletic money, but they try and divide it out based on how valuable the player is to them at the end of the day. So that's how the athletic scholarships work. Now they also offer academic scholarships and financial aid uh, need-based scholarships so there's also those and that's what allows like some players that you know let's say a guy only gets a half athletic scholarship that's what allows players you know if they have good grades that's why we always say get good grades you know um if they have good grades they can get good academic money as well so let's say you have you know, half athletic scholarship and you have to cover all the other uh, tuition yourself, you can get some academic scholarships as well, which can knock it down. And let's say you also have, you know, a bit of a tough financial background too. You can get some financial need-based scholarship money as well, and that could cut it down too. So let's say you have all those three factors working for you. You could almost, if not completely get a full scholarship even though it's not a full athletic scholarship technically so coaches try and work with players and parents this way strategically too at the ncaa d1 level now if you look on the ncaa d3 side of things it's basically the same process except no athletic scholarships so this is why again we always tell players try and get the best grades possible in high school and if you're continuing your studies part-time in a university um, definitely try and get the best grades you can because that'll give you the most scholarship money that you could potentially have. And also if you take the SAT, like when you take the SAT or ACT, you know, try and crush those and get the highest score you possibly can. Because if you have good grades and you have a good, you know, standardized test score, either SAT or ACT, you're going to be eligible for the max, you know, academic scholarship that that school offers. And you can potentially, you know, if you're lucky or if you work really hard and you have good grades or exceptional grades, you could potentially get additional scholarships from there. Who knows, right? So the, the better your grades, the higher the chance and the more money that you're going to get off that way. So that's why it's so important. Um, also, you know, if your family's struggling, like at the NCAA D1 level uh, financially, you can definitely, you know, get some financial aid scholarship in certain schools. Most schools, I would say, definitely offer those. You know, when I went to Trine, uh, I got a nice, you know, financial aid scholarship as well. So that, that really helped. And it made, you know, NCAA D3 hockey affordable. Now there's no athletic scholarships. So I wasn't able to get you know, a full ride. And I had, like, me and my parents had to fork over some money to the university, but it was still manageable. It was still doable because, you know, I, my parents always stressed on me and I always stressed on myself to get good grades. And financially we were in a position where we could get a little bit of extra help and money too. So that's, that's just a way you can look at it. You know, typically at the NCAA D3 level, let's say you have, you know, really good grades and you get uh, financial aid as well. 
I would say you should probably be looking at around 12 to 15,000 ish USD, all expenses paid a year varies program by program a lot so that's just a rough estimate and let's say you don't like your parents are, are doing great financially and you have um really good grades then at that point you should probably be looking around you know maybe 20 to twenty five thousand usd a year you know all expenses paid but again that depends on so many things and that's where as advisors we kind of dive into the nitty-gritty and try and cut the ca the cost down for you as much as possible but Overall, that's you know how it works at the NCAA D3 level and NCAA D1 level in terms of scholarship. All right, so one quick caveat that I want to mention here are the Ivy League schools at the NCAA D1 level and then the NESCAC schools at the NCAA D3 level. And there might be a few other schools and exceptions that we're not going to touch on this video specifically, but in general, these are the exceptions here. These guys only offer need-based scholarship money. They don't offer any athletic scholarships and they don't offer any uh, academic scholarships. So only financial base uh, based on your parents' income. Now that could be to your advantage or that could be to your disadvantage, right? If you're, you know, a person that where their parents, you know, kind of struggle a little bit financially and need a little bit of help, these schools will probably be ones you really want to look at because you're probably going to get a sweet deal going there. And they're, they're great schools, right? And obviously you have to be a great student to get into these schools. But if you do, you know, that, that could be a great option for you. Whereas if your parents make a ton of money, let's say you got one parent that's a you know heart surgeon, the other one's like a, a really great lawyer, you know, probably the, these ones, you know, they, they could probably pay for your whole education, but it's going to be quite expensive. So that's just something to consider too. But yeah, these, these are the, the exceptions to the rule when it comes to, you know, NCAA D1 versus NCAA D3 costs. But overall, that's how the whole system works on the cost side of things. All right, so that's pretty much a wrap here for the video, but let's just recap real quick so basically in this video we analyze the differences between ncaa d1 and ncaa d3 hockey we first looked at you know the caliber of play how do both kind of compare to other you know calibers that you might be familiar with and then we looked at the overall experience you know what's it like to go to ncaa d1 hockey versus ncaa d3 hockey afterwards we looked how you know the recruiting process is different for both you know how do ncaa d1 coaches recruit players what do they look for and then ncaa d3 what do they look for and how do they recruit and then finally we looked at the cost difference and that's just basically you know how much roughly and generally speaking how much does it cost to play ncaa d1 hockey versus ncaa d3 hockey and we hope by going all over all those things it really sheds some light on things and it really helps you out and can help you make more informed decisions as you're moving forward and as you're looking at different options to go play uh, collegiate hockey somewhere so we hope that we help with all this info all right now before i let you go just a reminder to smash that like button hit that subscribe button hit that notification bell and share this video if you like the content by sharing, you not only help us grow as a channel, but you help other hockey players and parents out there that could really use this information. So if, if you have a sec, sharing on Instagram, you know, Facebook, Twitter, whatever platform you're on, it could really go a long way in helping other people out. So if you have a sec, please do that. We'd really appreciate it. And again, if you want to reach out to us at any time, you can feel free to drop a comment down below, or you can even email us at info at ahadvising.com and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. And last quick thing, if you want to check us out on any of our other platforms, there's a link down in the description below. You can just click on it and it'll show you all the other things that we're up to. So if you're curious, you know, feel free to click on that link below. And that's it. Thanks so much for watching. Hope you enjoyed the video and we'll catch you on that next one.